Christiana is going to talk to us about why going into fintech is the best career decision you could make. So please give a warm, warm welcome to Christiana. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much to Susan and, and to Natalie, to the whole WeTech revolution. Thank you so much for this opportunity. But good evening, everyone. Nice to see you, to see you. Nice. Oh, yes, we're in a British audience. So, um, first and foremost, before I even start my talk, thank you so much for that introduction, by the way, uh, uh, Susan. I would like to find out how many of you have a smartphone with you tonight? Right, I'd like you to bring it out, please. I just want to do a, a little uh, quick exercise. You see, I'm someone who has, or who teachers called uh, someone who had ants in their pants, so I don't keep still. And what you'll find out is a lot of uh, the stuff that I'm going to share with you today, most of it is inside my head, which is why there's not that much words on the screen. So it's just the way I work, it's the way that uh, resonates with me. But if you've got your smartphones, I want you to show me if you've got Facebook. <laughs> Put, raise your hand if you've got Facebook. All right, I want you to open your Facebook app. I'm telling you, this is something that you've never experienced at a FinTech talk before in your life, which is why I'm so glad that I'm going first. So um, yes, if you have Facebook or Instagram, please open up that app. I would like you to stream it live. And there is a reason why I'm asking you to do this. Uh, my mum and dad don't know where I am at the moment. <laughs> this should help them, uh, you know, uh, sh this should provide a clue for them. Um, so there's more reasons than that, to, to be brutally honest. Uh, one of the people who wanted to come, unfortunately, is not here in the UK. They're in Germany. However, they still have access to social media where they are. And so I would like them to have access to this too. So, mum, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> um, right, so I want to find out from everyone here, I'm going to need your, again, your cooperation as well. How many of you are working in fintech or you're already in fintech at the moment? Raise your hand, please. Wow, that's a fair amount of you. Wow. I, the question was, is... How many of you are in fintech? Fantastic, thank you. How many of you are looking to get into fintech? Raise your hand. Okay, now I, I know with the introduction uh, there is uh, an acknowledgement that I passed GCSE Maths at nine, but I'm just telling you now, based on my math skills, not everybody put up their hand to <laughs> both of those questions. So I'm, I'm wondering what could maybe one or two of you who didn't put their hand up for either of those questions, can you please shout at me what it is that brings you here today? Oh, yes. Um, I work for a charity that um, does community currencies, but it's analogue at the moment. Okay. So we want to understand how tech could help us as we scale. Um, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> any other uh, thoughts or any other reasons why people have come today? Sure, so you want to find out more information about the, the, the industry and how it's going to impact businesses. Fantastic. So, by the way, can I get you all to give a round of applause to the people who gave contributions? That's very helpful. Thank you. So the reason why I'm asking this is I, my talk, I have the pleasure and I have the honor of sharing with you why, honestly, uh, fintech is one of the shrewdest career decisions that you can make. And I was fortunate enough to have been uh, featured as an influential women of fintech by a leading fintech recruitment firm called Harrington Star, which is why this is here. So without further ado, I'm going to move on uh, with my talk. So there's a few things that I want to share with you today. My background and more about how uh, my love of maths started uh, how I got into the industry, where I am now, why fintech is a growing industry, and no, it's not a typographical area. It does say why everyone and their dog wants to work in it. I've had a lot of people approach me saying that they want to work in this industry, and I thought I'd dedicate this talk and this presentation to them. So, let me quickly talk through my background. So, as, as Susan said, I, I passed my GCC Maths at nine, as you do. Um, 
what happened was I was empowered to take really um, my energy because I was a ball of energy at nine years old. I don't think anybody makes any reasoned decision when they are nine years old. But I loved maths. And what happened was my older sister um, actually passed her GCSE maths at 10. And when they were trying to identify you know, what it was, what attributes he had, and how to, I, how to nurture it and how to support. They came up with the gifted and talented, her teachers, and um, also other community organizations. And then my parents then were like, okay, right, so this is what happens. And then so when it came to me, it was far easier to spot what it meant for someone to have a high attainment in maths or someone to really enjoy learning about numeracy and that's how the opportunity came about so i mean I, I wish i could show you you know my baby pictures from when i was nine but seeing as i'm i've got no makeup on today and i haven't aged in 10 years can you just take it that i look something similar to what i look like today you know just for pictographic purposes in your head um so following that uh, i had a lot of friends and they were asking me for help on their homework, their maths homework. And I was like, wow, there are a lot of people who are asking for help on their homework. And I'm only one person. There are 15 people. You know, uh, you know I, I thought, how do I disseminate this information to them? I found out that they were avid readers of Harry Potter. Yes. So from there, I was like, OK, fine. I'm not the biggest fan of English. But I love my friends enough to be able to write a book for them in a format that they will understand. So I figured, OK, fine, I can't split myself 15 times, but I can reach my 15 friends with 15 books. So I thought, well, I, 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 I sort of, uh, honestly, I, I had ants in my pants, as, as you do. And um, I was provoked because I was one uh, lesson away from a detention in English. And I was like, you know, as, as, as my punishment, my English teacher said, OK, Christiana, I want you to read your maths textbook. I said, I said hold on, sorry. You want me to do what? She said, I want you to read your maths textbook because I've warned you millions and millions of times to bring in your book. I said, fine, whatever, I will read it. So I read it. And I was like, okay, fine, look, you know what, I'm, I'm getting so bored of this right now. I know I can write something better that will reach my friends. And that was the turning point when I wrote the book. And I actually wrote it with my siblings as well, uh, both my older sister and my younger sister. And, you know, it was a community-wide project. It really wasn't something that we thought about. It wasn't something that was really, you know, predetermined or planned. I was a kid. I was not. I mean, uh, what am I supposed to do? Um, so... We wrote the book together, and then there was an idea to put it up on Amazon. And before we knew it, it was just like it, it literally it sold out. And we were like, what, what, like, what is going on here? So we then realized that the scale of it was far beyond you know, um, either what we had imagined with our friends, um, but also we now saw that actually there were people around the world that wanted the book too. And that was something I was certainly taken aback by. So following that, a few years later, uh, I became one of the youngest people to embark on undergraduate studies at the age of 11 here in the UK. And that, again, was a really unique experience for me because it was the first time I left home. And honestly, if you know anything about kids and their limited cuisine, uh, let's just say I was eating a lot of sweets. <laughs> um, but, but what it, it demonstrated to me, really, was that I could survive in tougher environments, but also I could deal with more complex concepts, and it gave me confidence. Because growing up, I had speech therapy. So I thought that, with all due respect, believe it or not, despite all of these uh, achievements, I thought a measure of intellectualism was how well you spoke. So I thought, oh, well, I could, maybe I'm good at maths, but I'm really rubbish at English because I don't know how to speak properly. I'm being told my sentences aren't, don't make sense and they're not being constructed properly. So how the hell are people supposed to understand me, you know, if I can't even structure my sentences properly or, or talk? So I thought, okay, it is what it is. I went for speech therapy. My parents 
did their best to encourage me to keep on working on my speech and that's why it is that you see what you see of me today. So what you see, you think this is a confident speaker, but no, not necessarily. What you see is actually years and years of me working on my speech to be able to be able to share this story with you today. So following that, I'm, you know, as you grow up, you start to discover new and different things. And one of the things that I stumbled across on, uh, of was C++ and Java. And the reason why I mention that here is we're, at, you know, fundamentally this is women in tech. And I felt that for the first time, I don't think I've ever really mentioned this publicly, about my C++ and Java experience. Normally, I would hide that because I don't do it anymore, right? So I thought, you know what, it's a tech conference, let me share that experience. So I did C++ and Java uh, because I enjoyed playing FIFA uh, when I was growing up at my cousin's house, my parents said that they didn't want me to have a, a PlayStation. I said, fine, I'll go to my cousin's house instead and go and play it. <laughs> so, um, um, and, and so I wanted to understand more about, uh, you know, the technology that went on, you know, behind that. And by the way, uh, just for those of you who are wondering, this is what the book looks like. I thought I put this there, you know, as the closest possible picture as that I could get to an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old looking like me. These are actually my two younger brother and sisters who are holding the book as well because um, they actually passed their GCSE at six and one of the books that they read was my book. So it wasn't about, it wasn't about me showcasing my knowledge. It was really about how do I help people who needed help with maths without having to duplicate myself because I only knew that there was one of me and there was many of them. One to many. Oh, don't worry. That's okay, don't worry. Uh, next one. Don't, don't worry, I can, I can carry on. So how did I get into the industry? Thank you very much. Uh, so how did I get into the industry? You may ask. So when I became an adult, I started to experiment. I started to explore because I have varied interests. And I, as I said, you know, I don't keep still. So as Susan said, in 2014, Apple Pay came out. And I was quite shocked because I was thinking, hmm, I thought Apple was a smartphone maker. I thought they made the iPod, the iTouch. You know, I thought that they were in the sort of game of, of making, you know, laptops as well, Apple Macs. How many of you here have an Apple Mac? Or MacBook, sorry. Oh, but, oh. <laughs> so, I should expect that for a techie. <laughs> um, so, so when Apple came out with Apple Pay, I thought, oh, something in my mind just went off. It didn't quite, you know, sort of resonate in my head because I was like, how is a smart smartphone maker now moving into payments, now moving into financial services? Hmm. Okay. Well, you know what? I'll just park that idea to one side. Let's see what happens. Then. Does anybody know who this guy is? Can, I mean, it's a bit hard if you're sitting over there. I, I, can, I can appreciate. Who? <laughs> Matt Damon. I wish. I wish, honestly. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wish. Damn. If only it was that entrepreneurial. Who? George. George. Someone. Oh, man. Um, anybody else? Unfortunately, it's not George, although I wish his name was George. Maybe it could have been. Anybody? Any guesses? Okay, don't worry, I'll put you all out of your misery. Uh, this guy is called Max Levchin, and he is one of the founders of PayPal. So what I found out is that he'd set up an interest-free loan bank for students, and I thought, whoa. <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting that. But I then saw more and more disruption taking place in financial services through who I consider to be Silicon Valley heavyweights or tech giants. So he set up a fur. Then, what happened was shortly after that, I met this guy. Does anybody know who that is? Can anybody see him? Can everybody see that picture? Anybody guess? Yeah, that's right. Give him a round of applause. Come on. And, and, and who is Steve Ballmer, sir? Uh, he's the new CEO of Microsoft. Wasn't yeah, he's the former CEO of Microsoft. So it was a, a massive life. It, yeah, he lost his hair, I guess, through the, the stress of being CEO, you know. I mean, but he, he's still considering, at least, he still looks all right. Um, 
Uh, so, so, so I met him. Um, I, I met him a few years ago, and it completely changed my scope of what I felt I was capable of achieving. But it also made me realise, oh, you know what? Maybe this tech industry, there's something for me. Maybe there is. And then the big bombshell is this. Does anybody know who that is? Although some. Yes, that's. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I, I probably should have given you. You know what? Can I, do you mind if I quickly give him a prize? Because yeah. I think that participation, please um, give, every, give him a round of applause, please, everyone. Sorry. I should have given you that. Thank you. Many congratulations, and I'll explain what that is in, in a second. So, so um, Jack Dorsey is the founder of Twitter. And a few years ago, um, he came to launch his payments company, Square. And that's when I was like, hold on a minute. Hold on. I really want to see what's going on here. There must be something that is taking place here that is so exciting that someone would leave their home or would leave Silicon Valley, would leave the States to come all the way to the UK to come and promote a payments company. So I thought, wow, I've got to do this. So then I was like, okay, well, I had uh, experience in City, HSBC, um, and, each, and even randomly Channel 4. So I was like, okay, right, so based on that experience, where can it take me in financial services? So I went to a hackathon, which was uh, sponsored by uh, Factum Foundation as well as ID2020, where we had to give, and thank you, where we had to give, um, we had to use blockchain to give an identity to 230 million children who had been unaccounted for by authorities in Africa and in India. So the idea that here the team, myself and my uh, team members came up with was that you take a picture of the child's face and their fingerprint every year of their life and that gets stored on the blockchain until they turn 18 years old and then that child owns their own digital identity. Just out of, out of interest, I mean, I know based on what I've described of you with my background, you must think I have a penchant for asking difficult questions. I completely get it. So I thought I'd truck this in. Can anybody guess which one is me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so that's what led me to um, where I am to today. Um, so really, uh, after, thank you. So after that experience, it exposed me to digital identity. And that was my route into the industry. So um, actually, it was based on that hackathon that I got the feature in, in MIT Technology Review because they'd come down. I'd been invited to Cambridge Blockchain Conference, and that's where they interviewed me. And then, actually, it was based on um, this uh, honour that I'm very humbled to have. I know that, honestly, all these, all this, like, accolades and all this representation, all of this wouldn't have come without the support of friends, family, people in the industry who were just really awesome and gave me this opportunity. So I thank every, I'll take this opportunity to thank everybody. Um, but, you know, with that, what it's enabled me to do is to have a remit in the industry to be able to empower the next generation to believe that this is a career path for them. This is not just for the tech guys or the guys from Silicon Valley, but this is also from, for, for someone who grew up in inner city myself. I'm from inner city London. I grew up not too far from here in a place called Hackney and a place called Walthamstow as well. So the fact is, I was prepared to go to Silicon Valley to see those guys, and now they're coming to the UK means that this is where it's happening. That's why this is the number one you know, fintech hub on the planet. And, it, and I, can, I still believe that even with the presence of the B word, which I'm, I'm not going to mention, um, I've been told it's a swear word, <laughs> um, you know, the opportunities here are, are vast, which is why it is that I thought I'd... I'd share this as, as part of the talk. So, um, fintech, it's a growing sector. Why is it a growing sector? Fundamentally, it's because of the technology, which is why I'm so happy with the other speakers who are going to be speaking today, especially around uh, you know, blockchain and, and, and crypto in, in general, because I feel like that's where the scope is. Dell did a recent report 
called Realizing 2030, a divided vision of the future. And what they found is that 85% of jobs that will be available in 2030 has not even been conceived yet. They haven't started yet. They don't exist, right? So that means that there is an emphasis on tech skills. However, the scope of opportunity in this industry far stretches far beyond the tech. You are looking at the regulation. And so therefore, compliance is a big, big issue and is a big thing in this industry. Risk is a big thing in this industry, um, as well as innovation. Because the incumbents are now saying, OK, wow, we've got a small fintech that can actually sit down and automate what we currently do, which is what is core to us, our, our core business. Now that they're able to disrupt that, what do we have to fall back on? We now have to innovate. We now have to strategize. We now have to come up with something even better than what we have now, but even better than whatever is on the market. And that's why the diversity of roles is expanding because there's so many different ways that now incumbents want to reposition themselves in the face of this. Then lastly, where can you find a fintech job? Oh, isn't this fantastic? So one of the places that I thought I'd mention is Harin Tassar. They're a fin leading fintech recruitment firm, but also Plexus. Their emphasis is more on blockchain jobs in general, as well as Blockgram, who do both Blockgram and, and fintech recruitment. I thought, you, do you know what? Um, I don't, like, when it comes to looking for jobs, definitely you have to be creative, but don't underestimate the simplicity of using Google. I, I, that's why I put it there. I thought, you know what? I don't want to sit down and overcomplicate it. I want to make it super simple. And, and, and the simplicity of using Google, uh, I feel that sometimes it's completely underestimated in general. So please don't underestimate it. Then lastly, um, I actually put together um, seeing the need for empowering and preparing young graduates for the world of work. I, oh, sorry, uh, well, women in tech. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about this and then I'll talk about uh, the other events. So Women in Tech Leaders, um, so it's a fantastic initiative. Natalie touched on it brief, uh, briefly before, but it's all about connecting the movers and shakers in the industry. It's all about inspiring the next generation of uh, talent into this industry 4.0 revolution. And the goal is partly to have 50% of all keynote speakers and panelists in tech events as women. Like, it's, it's very important. You'd be surprised. There's still a lot of underrepresentation, which is why it is so humbling and it's so exciting to me that there are so many women here. Like, it's awesome. Thank you so much for coming, honestly. Um, but this is why it is that it's such a great um, decision to make because you're on the cusp of an amazing opportunity to change the world. So on that basis, if you would like to get in touch, I thought I'd drop my details. I'm available on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, also Instagram, and Channel of Empowerment. What is Channel of Empowerment? So a few years ago, um, or in fact not a few years ago, actually a year to 18 months ago, I uh, set up a, a miniature YouTube channel called Channel of Empowerment. Um, but really, it was a movement that started on Instagram and YouTube to empower people to take their lives to the next level. What I found out is one of the people who was watching the videos that I do, Message for Today, which is an inspirational 15-second video, um, they graduated from university. Woo! <laughs> so, so I was mega proud. I was mega. I was so happy for them. Congratulated them. And then the next step is work, going into graduate employment. So I found out that one of the other followers that I had is starting work at Microsoft. So she was asking me, Christiana, okay, so what is the world of work like? I was like, oh, snap. So that's how Empowered to Work came about because I was thinking, oh, how many other people are in that position that want to know that I'm too scared to ask or they don't have access to me as a resource or some format of me as a resource? So this is what came out of that idea and that brainstorm the Empower to Work event, how to get a head start in your career. And so it was really there at an event, funnily enough, held on a Friday. And you'd be surprised how many people would come for a career development event on a Friday. You'd be surprised. Um, and um, really, it's there to make sure that if you're a young graduate, you're aware of the skills, the attributes, 
that you need to be able to survive and thrive in a workplace with the rate of change that we currently have at the moment. And so I did one um, on the 7th of December. The next one is actually on the 7th of December, again in Rise London, which is why I've got the bags available today. And I would like to give it away to whoever would be um, interested in having one uh, in the home of FinTech and Rise, not too far from here, where really it was an opportunity for people to learn about how they could upgrade their skills and everything that they needed to succeed in, in their career. So we had a keynote from a former world champion. We also have free food and live music. Let me tell you, I know, I know, right? Damn, I wish I was a graduate right now entering the workforce. Um, so, so that's available. If you want to find out more details, please message me. It's Channel of Empowerment. Hence why it's called Empower to Work, to empower young graduates to be able to survive and thrive in this industry, ever-changing industry. And we want to be able to increase the pipeline because what Women in Tech Revolution have done is fantastic in terms of raising the profile and raising the awareness of the women in the industry. But we need a pipeline and we need a consistent pipeline that's going to feed into that work. And that's what this event is designed to do. So, Thank you so, so much for listening. You've been an absolutely amazing audience. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>